We're with uh, Steve, Steve Schwartz in his shop in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Thanks for inviting us in to take a look around. Thanks for coming. Steve has been a member of Richmond Woodturners since 2016. Uh, if you're familiar with Steve, you'll, you'll remember his silhouette embellishments to bowls and platters. It wasn't long ago that Steve did a, a complete demonstration for us from soup to nuts on how he, how he makes those uh, uh, embellishments. Um, Steve, obviously you've been talking or you've been turning a little bit longer than uh, uh, 2016. When did you start turning and what got you started in the first place? I went to college to be a uh, shop teacher and one afternoon and possibly two afternoons they said this is a lathe, it was a Paramatic 90 and this is how you're supposed to mount a piece of wood and carve. And they told me wrong and we used uh, spindle gouges to make bowls and we scraped with uh, skews and the only thing they used correctly was a parting tool. But uh, when I finished the class and I finished uh, my degree, I was now uh, certified to be a teacher of woodworking and to teach people how to do this wrong. So we, when I had, I was teaching middle school and I taught the kids how to do it wrong, but we had fun. We scraped the crap out of stuff and we stand to things and Some it was middle school. Some of us do that now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I did that wrong um, and made things that were very nice because I used the 80 grit gouge. So I would carve with a round nose scraper for an hour and then I would sand and get blisters sanding at high speed for two hours and when I was done it looked really nice. Uh, except that now I can do the same bowl in 45 minutes. So it's been a while yeah, since good. you've been turning. I noticed the smock says uh, capital area wood turners. Are you a member of two clubs? So that's a good point. Um, I was at the Expo Center in DC and uh, there was a table and these people were talking about this wood turning club in DC and hating driving I told my wife there is no way I am going to drive an hour and something to go up to some meeting up in DC and then I don't know, a year or two later one day I was bored and I said yeah what the heck I'm gonna go and uh, C.A. Savoy who is the, the leading member the guy who organized the club was doing a demo on using the Wolverine grinding system and he was a great guy. Uh, and so I said, you know, I have to have that because I have a bowl gouge, which is sharpened entirely wrong because that's the way it came. And uh, he trusted me, put the grinding system into my car, and I told him I'll write him a check when I get home. And uh, that was really the turning point. That was 1999. Um, so I've been turning, learning how to do it correctly since then. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, uh, so, and now were you... Uh, ever an officer of that club? I was a uh, past president at, at one time, um, but it's not fun being a president. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that we're s sitting and standing in, in front of a Powermatic lathe. Would you, uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about your lathe, what you like about it? Uh, right. Maybe uh, any, any uh, um, parts of the lathe that you use more than others? All right, so as a shop teacher, when I went in, you know, I didn't know anything. I was a young kid, and everything was paramatic. Everything was green. There were no golds. So everything was green. It was all paramatic. The lathes, the table saws, surface planers, the band saws, everything. And so I had an affinity for paramatic. Uh, and then I started out, I bought uh, this gold lathe, which we'll show you in a little bit, um, and another one, a paramatic 90, at an auction, and that started my collection of paramatic. I decided to stay with Paramatic as I bought new equipment because I wanted my chucks to fit and other interchangeable parts so that I never had a, a worry. Like if you have a one-way, one-way is a great lathe. It's in millimeters. Who, who uses millimeters? So then I'd have to get different inserts for chucks and you can't go from one lathe to the other with the same chucks. So this is the Paramatic, the largest Paramatic that they make. This is the 2442. So a 12 inch swing, I can do a 24 inch bowl. I can slide the headstock off the end and I have an external uh, tool rest, which I've never used. So I could theoretically do something like a ship's wheel that went all the way to the floor and all the way up to the ceiling. Um, what I like about this one, this one was included everything. It came with the light kit. It came with a metal cowl, which hooks on here and slides forward and back for safety but it was too much of an inconvenience, so I never used it. 
it came with a built-in vacuum system. And the vacuum system uses compressed air. So compressed air goes through a port uh, and like blowing um, a jug band and you blow across the top of a bottle and makes a noise, it creates a vacuum. And it supposedly brings up uh, 22 to 24 inches of vacuum, but it doesn't. So it's a great system and it's built in and it's very clean to use, but it doesn't have a strong enough vacuum. So when I get to the next lathe, I'll show you what I've been using instead. So one of the things I also like about the Paramatic is the height. I've used a couple of other lathes that were built for shorter people, and this is a comfortable height for me. And it wouldn't be bad if this was even an inch or two higher for me, uh, but it's really hard to get down lower to turn. You really have to stand up straight. I also like the lighting system because I can maneuver that on the outside of the bowl and on the inside of the bowl. And then I added track lighting for extra lighting. Let's see. I can't think of anything else. I like that it has a tool rack for accessories on the end. And then I have another tool rack over here behind me for other things like calipers, wrenches, uh, measuring tools. I don't know if you've seen one of these. Homemade uh, depth gauge for when you're making a bowl. It helps to keep you from making funnels. And then racks of tools. And I have a lot of tools. I've been collecting tools for years. Um, I sell things. I consider myself a professional wood turner, although I can't pay any bills with it. Um, to pay bills, I would have to, I don't know what I would have to do. I don't know how you could make a living and, and pay for a house and a car. But because it is a, a business and I'm making money, if I decide that I want to buy another hollowing rig or I want to buy a couple of extra tools or experiment with a different tool, I just buy another tool because that's found money. And when it comes to tool handles, I generally speaking like a long handle so you can anchor it to your hip while you're trying to cut. I notice you've got other lathes. Uh, if I remember right, you you can teach classes. You're set up to teaching classes. You'll take up to two people. That's right. Uh, I'll teach. What, what kind of classes would you give them? Um, when it comes to classes, I leave it wide open to what somebody wants to learn. But 95% of the time, people want to learn how to make a bowl. And the objective when I teach someone how to turn a bowl is how to use the complex angles of a bowl gouge, how to sharpen it, and then how to use it properly. And what I find with everybody, and it's understandable, when you haven't used it before, you keep on thinking you're going to cut intuitively and you're going to push it with your left hand and push it through the wood. And actually what you do is push everything with your right hand, get it started, and you steer. And then all you have to do is wait for the wood to get out of the way and steer, and it goes right around easy peasy. So after you've made four or five bowls, you find out, well, you were killing yourself because it was a lot easier than you thought. So that's basically what I teach when I teach a class. But you will teach one or two One people. or two, yeah. And they can contact you directly and ask, do you teach such and such, or can you teach me a particular subject? Exactly. And then if you're an experienced turner and you want to learn how to make hollow forms or a burial urn, or you want to learn how to do hollowing from the bottom of a vessel, or make two-part vessels. Anything that you've seen demos on or you've seen someone else make, I can show you how to do. Do you have a set time that you set that you teach the classes or do you work around their schedules? I am very flexible as far as classes. Um, being retired, if I'm around any time during a day or evening, uh, during the week, uh, we can find time together. Weekends, my wife uh, gets dibs on weekends, so I don't do too much on weekends. Uh, this is my Paramatic 25, uh, no, oh, 30, 30, 2035. So I can do a 20 inch diameter bowl, which means the swing is 10 inches and up to 35 inches long. Uh, this lathe is essentially the exact same motor, the exact same bed weighs, the exact same weight. Uh, almost everything on here, the light kit is the same. Uh, it'll do all the same things that the other one will. It has speed changes by belt, and then it has a power inverter so that I can go from, I think, 16 revolutions a minute, which is if it was an enormously heavy piece of wood, uh, or I could go all the way up to two or 3,000, which is ridiculously too fast. Um, what it's set up for right now, 
back up. I was not happy with the suction on the Powermatic lathe, that the way it was built in on the other lathe. So I bought the Frugal Vacuum. And the Frugal Vacuum is a retired guy like us who is sell, finding aftermarket used motors. They come out of uh, medical equipment, uh, so they're not brand new, but he certifies that they're in good working order. You have this hose. You can buy chucks direct from him, or you can uh, make them yourself. And what he has is a bearing that's held in the center and the bottom. And I lathe turned this disc with a tenon, had it in the chuck, cut a groove. I put in um, PVC pipe, and I buy these collars from Rubber Ducky, a Rubber Chucky. Sorry, and they make these in different sizes and a bunch of other projects. So, this hose fits inside the vacuum hose. It's easy to put on in a hurry because all you have to do is tighten it back up in your tenon. I'll point out too, these trucks, uh, the truck keys are always a problem with where to put them, and I bought some, um, I don't know what you call these magnets, the Rare high powered. The rare magnets. earth magnets. Rare earth magnets. Stick it on there, and your tool uh, key will stick right on it. So now, uh, another word about vacuum is that you don't need one. They're nice so that you can take off the bottom of your bowl and have a perfect bottom, especially if you want to texture the bottom. But you don't need it because all you have to do is cut it down really, really small, take it off lathe, and then finish up that little spot. So all I'm really doing is spending a lot of money so that I can have a perfect bottom and not have a little spot that I have to hand touch up, which is silly. So now, when I turn the bowl, and I'll do it back up because there are a lot of people who don't, aren't familiar with this stuff, um, but I start with my bowl this way, on a face plate most likely, and I'll carve the bottom of the bowl and I make a tenon. I turn it around, I'm holding the bowl by my tenon, I carve out the inside and I finish my bowl. Now I want to get rid of the tenon, I reverse it again and put it on a bull nose, any kind of block of wood, or the vacuum. Line it up to the original center point. I always start the lathe making sure it's slow. Uh, the most dangerous thing I have ever found with a lathe is when you finished your last project, you polished it at uh, 1500 or 1800 RPM and you turned it off. And now you turn an out of round piece of wood that's not secure at that speed and it'll hit you in the face. So you start slow. You're going to be, if not absolutely perfectly in line, close enough. And then I will reflatten the very bottom and I will take off the tenon. When I turn on the vacuum, you can do that at slow speed to make sure, yeah, it's happy. So now I don't need this as long as I take light cuts. And this has a much better strength than the other vacuum, but you still take light cuts. If you get a hard cut, you push it off center. If you don't have your center point, then it's a struggle. Uh, this is a one of the original lathes that got me going. Um, uh, it's an old school shop. You can still come across these. They're a workhorse. Uh, this is a Paramatic 45. It has a 6-inch swing, so you can do a 12-inch bowl. This machine weighs about 350 pounds, so it dampens vibration. Uh, I have to level it, but it dampens vibration. If you get a lightweight lathe, then it doesn't dampen vibration, and it makes it much more difficult to work on. All right, and then... This lathe has been sold. Uh, I've been waiting six weeks for its owner to come and get it. As soon as he does, I'm going to modify my shop. I'm going to move the air conditioner down to the other window, and I'll show you why. But I have a vent that I'm going to put into this window, and I am going to build a table here, and this will be my dedicated area for pyrography. Because if you're familiar with my work, I do a lot of pyrography, and I need a, 
a new workspace instead of having to get everything out of the closets every time I want to use it. Drill press of one kind or another is pretty critical for lathe turning. I make a lot of pens, which I'll mention in a little while. I sometimes make hundreds of them. So I have this um, vise, which again is one of those things that you can tell your wife you have to have. Uh, so it's absolutely indispensable if you have money to spend. If you want to drill 40 pens at a time, you can drill it a lot more easily, and that's about it. Is where I store all my drill bits and drill accessories. This is where I store all my extra paints and lacquers and oils and solvents. This cabinet is a mess. It needs to be completely torn apart, but that's where more of those, I don't know where to put them pieces go. This is my wife's center. Um, I bought the scroll saw for her and she makes uh, scroll saw puzzles and uh, scroll saw boxes and all kinds of things. She's very talented. I'm a frequent uh, shopper at uh, Habitat for Humanity. So I get the kitchen cabinets from Habitat for Humanity for 20 or $30. This was an extensive cabinet that had all kinds of bends and angles in it, but it already had the wooden edge on it. So I just trimmed it down to fit over the top so that I have a good work surface. And these are my in-process pieces. Uh, a band saw is very useful in any shop because you want to cut off the edges of a blank in order to get it mostly in balance before you put it in the lathe. It's not absolutely necessary, but if your piece of wood is out of balance, you have to start very slow, and it takes a lot of time in order to get it back into balance before you can speed the lathe up. Uh, so I've been very happy with this uh, jet bandsaw. This was a, a gift to myself when I retired. You may have noticed um, that I have this black iron pipe that goes around the room and I have different ports for my air compressor for air and I have I can take any air hose with an air nozzle and pop it into three or four different places and it's all driven by this California air air compressor and when well I'll back up this used to be a business uh, in this space and when I closed the business and sold all the machines, it became my wood shop because I had it. Um, and I had this enormous air compressor that made tremendous amount of noise. And when I went shopping for an air compressor, I wanted one that was quiet. And I asked my wife to help me find one because how do you know how quiet they are? I want to go hear it. And so she did the obvious that I'm too old to really see obvious. And she wrote, quiet air compressors. And there's only one and it's California air. I'll turn this on briefly. So you can talk over that. And that is plumbed into the black iron pipe, which was left over from my former business. So I just took uh, use of it, and now I have air pressure upstairs and in three or four places around here so I can always blow off the machines or blow out dust out of the inside of a hollow form. So a small five-gallon compressor is feeding your entire shop. That's right. A 10 would have been better, but the five works. All right, another accessory that I have here that everybody needs to have is an old used microwave. And it's not to cook your lunch because the kitchen isn't very far away. Um, I will take a green piece of wood. This is literally what you call windfall wood. This was holly tree that blew down in the January storm, and I carved it into a bowl, and it was soaking wet, and I was getting, I had to keep on wiping off my mask because I was getting rain on my mask as it was spinning off. Um, after I got my final shape, I tried to sand it up a little bit with some 80 grit, but it turns all muddy and gummy. You put it in the microwave for a minute, let it cool. Put it in the microwave for a minute, let it cool. You might do that five or 10 or 15 times. Then you put it on the lathe and you sand it, and it's finished. 
Um, one of the reasons that you only do it for one minute is that if you're in a hurry, and I sometimes am the kind of person that is in a hurry, and you can put it on for three or four minutes, and it will catch fire on the inside of the wood and burn its way out. And I've heard stories of people who put it on their workshop table and went inside, and when they came back out, all it was was a little pile of ashes. But fortunately, it didn't, didn't burn down their shop. But microwaves are very useful. Now I have two sharpening systems. I've had this one. This is the original one I bought in 1999, and it works great. There are better grinders, but the, for what we're doing, it works great. Now, I'm using the Wolverine grinding system, which I could grab a, a gouge. So a bowl gouge has a very complex angle on it. And all you have to do is put it into the holder, line it up, in this case, for this tool, to two inches. I have spacers for different angles. This is my spacer for a bowl gouge. And then all you have to do is let it slide over the top of the stone. I see you have a CBN wheel. Uh, why CBN and what grit wheel are you using? Okay, the white aluminum oxide wheels are what come with almost all of these grinders. Eight inch white aluminum oxide. And they work great. And every once in a while they wear unevenly. Plus they also clog up with metal, the same as your sandpaper would clog up with sawdust. So what you have to do is dress the wheel with a wheel dresser to get it round and to keep it clean so that it'll continue to cut. The CBN wheel is, well this wheel is the original CBN stone that I bought and I have others. Uh, this one was a 150 grit and I've been using it for about 15 years and it's still working fine. So it'll last you forever and when you dress this, every time you dress it you take off a little bit of metal. Every time you take off a little bit of metal your tool moves downward a little bit and becomes smaller, a different angle. With a CBN, it will never change. It will always be exactly the same angle. And also, it, it just sharpens so nicely and easily. I, I noticed behind you, uh, I think I'm seeing a Tormek over here. Uh, you've got a, a shop dedicated to turning, and you've got a Tormek. Uh, why? And can you tell me a little bit about your opinion of the Tormek? Well... I've always heard great things about a Tormek and about how they make things ridiculously super sharp. Now when it comes to sharpening, um, when you're using a lathe, most people don't think of it this way, if you have a piece of wood that's about three inches in uh, four inches in diameter at a thousand revolutions a minute, that's a thousand, uh, the circumference is 12 inches, and your speed at a thousand revolutions a minute means that you're doing a thousand feet every minute. So if you've carved for five minutes, you've carved a half a, a, a mile, 5,000 feet, you've carved a mile of wood. So I sharpen every four, five, or six minutes. So now uh, the idea is that if it was sharper using a Tormek, that you wouldn't have to sharpen as often. So that's also the idea behind harder and harder steels. But it really means that I'll be able to sharp, sharpen every six minutes instead of every five minutes, if everything is ideal. So is it worth the extra effort? Now, I made the investment in this uh, because, like I said, I sell my things so that I have an excuse to make more. And the money is not paying the bills. It's not sending me on a trip to Europe. And, but if I say, well, I just want that tool, well, then I can justify just buying that tool because it's like free money. So I have about a $700 investment in this thing. And it was upstairs gathering dust for five years. And I brought it downstairs to experiment some more. And I'm going to put it back into storage and let it collect dust again or find someone who wants to buy it. So if you think you really need a Tormek, it's available, but I do not find any advantage in this. I don't find that it makes things significantly sharp or worth the effort. Well, what about wood storage, Steve? I don't see much wood. Um, yeah, well, I've got wood everywhere. So outside under tarps, I have pieces of logs. And when I cut up a log, you have to use all of the wood when you cut it. You can't cut squares and put them aside and, and let them dry for a while 
because they will always crack. So what I do is rough turn bowls. So outside in the shed, there's about 50 of them. There's some in the basement. There's some upstairs. So I'll rough turn a bunch of bowls, and then I'll make one start to finish out of wet wood like that holly bowl that I showed you a minute ago. Uh, then in the shed, sometimes I'll have triangles and odd shaped pieces out of my log and I don't want to waste them so I will bring them in the lathe and I will turn a cylinder really quick. It takes like three or four minutes. Turn a cylinder and then you don't have any pith but it's just like a stick and you can put them aside. And then after five or ten years when you want to build a box or you want to make a small urn you can always go out there and you can find a piece. I have uh, just two more questions. I see a broom here. Yeah. And uh, an air cleaner up here. Obviously, that's that's your dust management. But you said you were going to show us another type of air All cleaning right. and dust management. I do a lot of pyrography. And this is temporary because this will be at my burning station later. This is a booster fan for a dryer vent. It pulls 165 CFM through this four inch pipe. So while I'm doing pyrography, the smoke comes up and straight out. Um, final question, you sell an awful lot of pieces. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions or tips uh, for people who might want to try selling theirs? And, and how do you set your pricing? Well, I set the pricing the way I did in my business, uh, which is I just make a guess of what I think the market will bear. When it comes to uh, woodworking, I feel that you can't make something that should sell for $150 or $200 and sell it for $50 bucks because you don't need the money and you don't care. You just want to get rid of it because you're hurting the market for people who are trying to sell it for $150 or $200. It, it decreases the value of every, everybody else's work. So I try to sell at what I think is a low end of fair market so that I can keep on selling. Um, I've been selling at juried art shows, uh, so as far as ideas for where to sell and how to sell, I don't really have too much for suggestions. Okay. Well, Steve, thank you very much for an opportunity to see your shop. It's been fascinating and very educational. Good, and I had a good time. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, would you mind if people have any questions, if they contact you with any questions? No problem. You can call me or email me anytime. My email is artwoodturning at gmail. And my phone number is 540-408-3234. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much. Before we end, I'd like to bring Stan Vendruff around behind the camera. Stan, come out here for a minute. I'm not sure many of you know it, but uh, this is the guy that's behind the camera. He gives us the orders and tells us what to do. He does all of the editing of these, uh, preparing them so they can be shown to you, the audience. So, Stan, thank you very much for all of your hard work. It's a pleasure, Ray. Okay.